Hi, the best way to build a go-to-market strategy is to copy somebody else's. Unless you want to make money or grow consistently, in which case it's a really, really bad idea. Let me show you why. What is the right go-to-market strategy? Today I'm going to give you three go-to-market strategy examples, each of them very different one from the other. Yet each of them is precisely correct. Well, how can three strategies be different and yet all correct? It all depends on one thing, which I'm going to share with you in today's show. Well, let's take a look at the three companies and their buyers and their strategy. And at the end of today's show, I'll give you a tool for making these decisions or these differentiations or these discernments yourself. Well, for my first example, let's take a desktop computing company. This is somebody that wants to completely own the desktop computing market. Now, they're going to start by building something truly unique. Something that solves a problem that just hasn't been solved before. They're going to sell that unique proposition as widely as they possibly can. Not yet knowing what the pattern is, but as soon as the pattern forms, that it becomes clear where the adopters are from, then they're going to double down on that market. In this example, I'm going to use the design market. Why designers? Why would designers be a good first market? Well, they're kind of a cool market and therefore they're a great reference market. They're also a very insular, very contained market. And although people move between agencies or between roles, they kind of stay in the design industry. So it's a really great self-referencing industry. If you get a good toehold in that industry, it's going to be a visible toehold. Well, how should they dominate that new market? Work out what buyers need to solve the problem. Design and build a solution that completely meets that need to solve that problem and don't move on to your second market until you've absolutely nailed the first market. Once we've dominated that first market, we can move on to a second market. And let's say the second market is the education market. First one was design, second one's education. Why education? Well, again, it's a great self-referencing market. People tend to stay within the education sector just like they stay in design. So it's a great self-referencing market. Again, you get a toehold, you're going to be visible. After you've dominated that second market, then you go from maybe a third and a fourth, and then maybe a fifth and a sixth and a seventh. And at some point, it becomes silly to talk about niches because you're so wide, but the success started by focusing very narrowly in a single segment, and then a second, and then a third, and so on. Oh, by the way, your name is Apple, and the product is the Mac. My second go-to-market strategy example is a very different situation. You're now an established player in an established market. The market is the enterprise application software space. And you are an established player and the market is established. Not only are you established, but you're the gorilla. You're the biggest in that market. Well, that's the good news, but it's also the bad news. How do you grow, given that you're already the dominant provider in that market? Your board's after significant growth, you need to change something. So what they did is looked for new uses and new users. New uses of their technology and new users of their technology. And the first of those was sales and marketing. Well known in finance and IT, they moved into supporting the needs of sales and marketing. And the second new user group was small medium businesses. Businesses that weren't as big as the enterprise space that you've been traveling in really well, and you needed to push down into that market. It's a different strategy. You applied it and it worked. 20% annual growth heading towards $20 billion in annual revenue, and your name is SAP. For our third go-to-market strategy example, we'll stick with an established market, but this time instead of being the gorilla, you're a challenger. And as it happens, an unsuccessful challenger. The market has matured and the winners and losers have largely presented themselves. 
you're fifth or sixth in that market and you're losing money hand over fist. Well, that company got bought and became profitable overnight, literally. How do you take an unprofitable business in an established and probably profitable segment, but an unprofitable player and make them profitable overnight? And the answer was very simple. They sacked all of the sales and marketing people and discontinued the spend. Now this was not an admission of defeat, but rather we have gone as far as we can go with this technology, with this product. So what they did is they stopped trying to find new users at all and instead just served those that had already earned the right to serve for many, many years. By stopping all of the activity that was costing the money trying to find new customers, they focused on those that they already had, served them very well and became profitable overnight. The company was Ingress, it was bought by CA and it became profitable overnight because they recognised where they were in the market. And so we've got three go-to-market strategy examples where the right and winning strategy was very different in each case. And the key or the clue, the centre of those differences was not the product, not the vendor, but it was the market, the buyers. What strategy were the buyers ready for? What strategy were the buyers willing to accept? That was the fundamental element that each of them used to form the correct strategy. We're going to take a look at the framework for choosing the right strategy now. Well, it all comes down to what your market's ready for. The buyer, not the seller. I'm referring, of course, to Moore's chasm theory. Jeffrey Moore uh, put this forward in Crossing the Chasm and Inside the Tornado. But what many of us do when we describe market adoption is we put ourselves, the vendor, on that chart. It doesn't matter where you are, what matters is where your market is. We need to identify where the market is and therefore what they're ready for, and that changes over time. The right strategy when the market's new is very different from the right strategy when the market's more established, regardless of where you are in your journey. It's more about your buyer and where they are in their journey. In the early market, the buyers want to gain strategic advantage. So you should take an incomplete product to them that you can co-innovate with them because that's what they want. As the market matures a little bit, the next part of the market wants proof. That's different. They don't want to outstrip the competition. They just want to not make mistakes. And the best way to give them that proof is that they find others just like them buying too. So now you want to micro niche design and education, as my examples earlier. Instead of being broad, you're now selling very narrowly and it had better be a complete solution. And then after you've earned the first and then the second and then the third, seventh and eighth, tenth and ninth, there's no need to have a niche strategy because there's enough of the market that's bought. What does the market need at that point? It no longer needs confidence that the category is worth buying. What they now need to know is whether yours is the best product. You need a cracking product at market price or better and broad distribution. That's what the market needs. When the market peaks a little later on still and starts to max out, they basically want to prescribe the rules. They've bought a few times and they want to tell you how they want to buy and for what price. They want to buy from a well-branded supplier to be a safe bet. And they want that well-branded supplier to meet their needs as they perceive them. So now you're into customising around their well-shaped needs. And then finally, as the market declines, you will need to slow the decline down with new uses and new users, if you're the gorilla, or if you're not the gorilla, get out as gracefully as you can. Long story short, you're shaping a strategy according to what the buyer needs not what the seller wants to do, and that changes over time. So work out where your market is, work out what strategy is needed, therefore do it and don't just talk about it. 
build and execute on a strategy that precisely meets what the market needs at each point in time and plan for the next phase in the market so that when your buyers start to indicate that maybe you've run out of one group, you're ready to move on to the next. As you know, Funnel Plan is a great way for sales and marketing together to make decisions and then articulate their decisions about the objectives, the strategy, the velocity and the tactics they're going to use together to earn the right to serve new customers. Now we're talking today about strategy, that's the top of the diagram, and in particular, the strategy that's determined by the maturity of the segment that you're being targeted. Let's zoom in and take a look at that. We've already articulated the ideal client profile, and that is the characteristics that are true of all of the market. But I want to focus now just on the segments that we're going to target. Now I've got here four examples. We've got the creative director of large design studios, they're going to get 30% of our energy. And they're in bowling alley, meaning that they're the early adopters have already adopted and now those who haven't yet adopted are looking for proof. When we're done with that market, then we're going to sell into the education market. But right now, we're focusing all of our energy on that first market. Whereas, that was the Apple example, whereas in the SAP example, we were targeting the heads of sales and marketing in Fortune 500, the current target market, together with the CEOs of high growth SMEs. And we're going to give each of those 30% of our energy, but they're in different stages. Finally, the installed base, this is the Ingress and CA example, where I talked about sacking the sales and marketing department, that was kind of for effect. Let's say we're going to give them 10% of our combined energy, and that market's at end of life. The reason I wanted to show you the maturities here is to show you the consequences. Now I'm not going to define EMDG and CR deeply right now, but let me very briefly touch on them. Environmental marketing is what you might call branding and positioning. Demand generation doesn't need any explanation, you know what that is. It's creating an opportunity for your salespeople and your customers to talk. And channel readiness is, if you like, sales enablement. Everything that you do to get the sales force ready. My point isn't the definitions, but rather, as the market matures, the shape of your strategy is going to need to change. How much energy you spend on branding and positioning, how much on demand, and how much on channel readiness will change. All of those factors can be modeled in your funnel plan so that together we're applying the right amount of energy in our sales and marketing across the board. Consider having a different funnel plan for each of the major product groups that you're taking to market. Not like what I did in that example where I was trying to keep it short for you. Truthfully, you should have a different funnel plan for each major product group and probably each major geography. Now, if you don't have a funnel plan yet, go get a free one. In fact, why don't you do that now? Go to funnelplan.com, go get yourself a free funnel plan. Of course, there's more power in the paid versions, but start with a free one. Go to funnelplan.com, get yourself a free funnel plan where you can describe your target market and the strategy and the tactics that you're gonna to use to take that story to market. I've got lots more lined up for next week, and I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, may your funnel be full and always flowing. Our thanks this week to you for watching this week's show, to Jeffrey Moore for Chasm Theory, for John Ang for production, my name's Hugh McFarlane and it's been my pleasure to have scripted and presented this week's show.